I'm so happy that you're all here. Um, and it gives me a distinct uh, privilege and honor to introduce Professor Jeffrey Reed from Virginia Tech. Um, I don't know if some of you are from Virginia, but uh, he came a long way to give us this talk, so I'm uh, super grateful. Uh, he is, well, I have so much <laughs> to say about who he is. He's a Willis G. Worcester professor of uh, ECE at Virginia Tech. He's a director of Wireless VT. Um, he studied five companies we found out earlier. Um, you know, for those of us uh, who are faculty members, we usually go to DC to basically ask for money, right? <laughs> ask for funding <laughs> from federal agencies. He goes there because people want, like the White House needs his opinion, right? So that's the difference between Jeff and me, right? So, but, uh, but most of all, he's uh, just a dear friend and uh, he's uh, super, uh, knowledgeable and accomplished, yet he's super humble, so I have always a lot to learn from him. So he's going to tell us about 6G today, so um, I'm still catching up with 5G, so, but he's going to tell us even one step further, so I'm really excited. Uh, without any further ado, why don't we welcome him with a round of applause. Well, thank you for the invitation to come here. I had a great time. Um, actually, uh, Dartmouth is a lot like Virginia Tech in, in many ways. Uh, located in a rural area, quaint downtown. Uh, but one thing I think Dartmouth has an advantage of is that there's some really nice restaurants in this town. <laughs> in Blacksburg, Virginia, all we have are pizza places. And the local currency isn't terms of pizzas, and we're on the pizza system. So my talk is on what to expect from uh, 6G wireless, uh, which is a little uh, forward-looking. You know, we still haven't seen all of the great things that are uh, coming with uh, 5G networks. However, as researchers, this is a really hot topic right now. I have been in so many meetings that have been focused on developing a vision for what 6G should be, uh, particularly nowadays, because uh, wireless technology is seen as a technology that's essential to national security. So we've seen a renewed interest in wireless that I haven't seen for a long time. Uh, probably 20, 20 plus years in terms of the interest level that, that's out there now. And the investment that is being made in these technologies as well. Um, it's, it's been quite an amazing trip in the last uh, very he few years. started six companies. Oh. Oops. Oh, get rid of that. There we go. So I'll give you an overview of, um, of 5G uh, technology and, and particularly where it stands. Um, you may find some of my remarks to be somewhat surprising. Um, I'll talk about what my predictions are for 6G and why 6G is very relevant to industry, and government, and consumers. Uh, for instance, um, looking at what will the killer apps be for 6G technology. And then I'll, I'll summarize my key thoughts. Hope to leave plenty of time for questions. So here is a quote that I'd like to start with, and this is a quote from Tom Rondeau. Tom works for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, um, and the Department of Defense has actually been putting a lot of, of effort into 6G technologies and, and 5G as, as well. Tom heads the Future G program at the Department of Defense as well as the, as, uh, the 5G transition billions of dollars in budget. Tom's quote is, 
Three GPP standards are like Star Trek movies. Only the even ones are good. Okay, Star Trek II was great. Four, not quite as good, but still good. Um, so where do I stand on this? Um, here's my quote. <laughs> as of today, all wireless standards are always hyped and followed by huge initial disappointments until they're finally successful. And certainly you can read many articles on uh, the disappointment of 5G. And you probably thought I was going to hype it, right? <laughs> Just like everybody else has been. But actually there's been a lot of negative press on 5G as of recently. Uh, if you Google um, 5G, disappointing, you'll get over 16 million hits. Um, and it is true that there have been some issues with 5G. One of my points will be that 6G will probably fix 5G, just like 4G fixed 3G and 2G fixed 1G technologies. This is not um, unusual. Um, I've actually been doing wireless research for many years. I just take him in and towel him. Doing off. wireless research around 1990. Back from her. I'll go down and check the mail. Working on. Um, if you want. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. So, um, if you look back. Uh, on generations of, of wireless uh, technologies. They've all had their flaws and they've all had their hype. Uh, 1G systems, for instance, um, they're, they were analog systems. They didn't have any security. In fact, in the, in the lab, my students for entertainment, they used to listen to people's cell phone calls just by tuning a spectrum analyzer and putting it on di video differentiation and take alligator clips to a speaker, they could listen in on people's phone calls. And that was entertainment. And by the way, that was legal too. <laughs> the laws have changed over time to um, one point you could listen in on people's calls, but you couldn't tell anybody what you heard. And then they finally said it's illegal to listen in on people's phone calls. Uh, so 1G lacks security. And, and as a result, you had things such as cloning of phones, um, where you could buy on the black market a phone where you never had to pay a cell phone bill. It got billed to somebody else. I remember... Uh, my sister got a, like a $10,000 monthly phone bill because somebody cloned her phone. They essentially intercepted the equivalent of the credit card number for the phone and then used it to program other phones so that they were all billing to her account. 2G systems. Um, 2G systems had their problems too. And early on, it was the quality of the speech. The vocoders were not good. Those are the, the devices that uh, take your speech and form a digital representation for transmission. At the time, the service providers ran ads comparing the new digital phones to CD music quality. Outright lie. <laughs> Everybody in the industry knew they were lying through their teeth. The quality was poor than analog. Eventually, it, it became really good, but for the longest time, very poor audio quality. 3G um, promised data, but it just wasn't there. The content wasn't there. The data rates weren't there. The capacity wasn't there. You could do rudimentary email, but that was about it. And in the early days of 4G systems, 
the early 4G phones, the batteries would last about two hours. I had one of those phones, not, not pleasant. <laughs> And 5G, of course, is, is getting its uh, fair share of bad press. And just to prove that to you, here are the headlines um, associated with uh, 3G as well. I guess it goes to Tom Rondeau's point that the, the odd ones are bad, the even ones are good. Um, I Googled 3G disappointment and came up with six million hits. Much fewer for 4G and um, uh, fewer for 2G. Of course, that is a matter of, I suppose, internet uh, becoming more common over time. So 5G, it, you've heard a lot of hype about it. And to some extent, that hype is true. It is a revolution. It is a revolution in, in terms of the architecture of the network. Very different than what had been done before. Whole new core network. A core network is, is what does the authentication and the billing and the, uh, much of the call management. Um, that was brand new. Um, and will probably be with us maybe for decades the basic core network. Higher data rates, of course, came with 5G. But to be honest with you, we could have achieved those higher data rates with LTE. Uh, 5G had very few things that were different that would have allowed for much higher data rates. It was a matter of maybe putting in more cell sites or expanding the bandwidth of the transmission, but you could have achieved that with LTE. LT, uh, 5G was, writ, uh, was developed with three key things in mind. One is higher data rates. The second one was being able to support massive machine-to-machine -machine communications. And the specifications for that from the International Telecommunication is uh, union called for one million devices to be connected per square kilometer. Well, I haven't seen that yet. And uh, frankly, I don't think I will see that until 6G comes along, or shortly before 6G comes along at, at best. And the, and the third aspect of it was lower latency, and perhaps the most important aspect of 5G. Lower delay times. Why is that important? That is very important because, first of all, you couldn't do this with 4G. There's just no way it would be physically impossible to lower the, the latency. Uh, second is that once you have this lower latency, then you can do a lot of new types of applications. Applications such as uh, augmented reality. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a, a, a virtual reality uh, cave before, but a lot of people, like myself, get sick in those environments. And you can get really sick. And the reason is that there's a delay between your senses uh, that's unnatural. Um, I remember being in a virtual reality room where I was in a UAV flying along power poles very quickly. And within five minutes, I was ready to throw up. If your, your brain tries to um, uh, reconcile what your senses are telling you. And if there's not that reconciliation, you get sick. It's the same effect when you get car sick. It's, it's not your stomach that's making you sick, it's your brain that's making you sick. So what you have to do is you have to lower that latency so that the, the senses are receiving the information at the same time. 
It's, it's very important for augmented reality. It's also important for industrial automation. If you're going to have a factory floor that has these machines that are interconnect with each other and need to communicate with each other, and you have a very fast assembly line, you need to make sure that the timing is just right. Otherwise, your assembly line, the throughput on your assembly line is going to go way down. Uh, so this is a very important feature of, of 5G. Um, has it happened at scale? No, it hasn't. There have been demonstrations of this technology. Um, and there have been factories that have incorporated low latency 5G systems, but it's not broadly available at this point. It's still evolving. There are, of course, technology hurdles associated with that. There's also some business hurdles associated with it as well. You know, you would think that the wireless industry would be very progressive. It deals with the highest of tech. Not really. <laughs> That's a myth. They're extremely conservative. Uh, the data revolution that we had in wireless communications should have happened about five years earlier, by the way. And the reason why it didn't happen is the service providers didn't know how to charge for it. They, they would, weren't sure that they would charge the right pr price, either too much or too little, and they just didn't want to take the chance. So you, you actually see very conservative moves on the part of service providers. They know that the public likes faster data rates. Will the, will the public really like low latency? Will it really like massive machine-to-machine -machine communications? So here is the timeline for getting to uh, 6G. 6G is something that the performance specifications are initially established by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. That's sent to a, a standards organization called 3GPP, and I forgot what it stands for. It's one of those acronyms after a while. It loses its, its its meaning, third generation partnership, yes. Um, uh, but um, that organization is the organization, it's an international organization, involves many thousands of people participating to come up with these wireless standards. And as they develop um, a new step up in the standard, they come up with what they call a release. And the original 5G was released in the 2018 time frame as release 15. And that was just the basic uh, enhanced mobile broadband, or EMBB, high throughput standard. And they started working on some of the aspects of ultra-reliable low latency, but not enough to really do anything with. In subsequent releases, they increased the capability of 5G. One of the uh, um, aspects of it is V to X. V standing for vehicle, two representing two, <laughs> and X meaning anything. So it's vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle type of communications. Um, they also looked at, at how you could do precision geolocation or how you could run your 5G network in uh, license-free spectrum, like what Wi-Fi does. You know, nobody has a, a license to that spectrum. You just use it, it's, it's public commons. So um, the, the evolution has continued. 
Uh, as of this month, or last month, they froze uh, what we call 5G advanced, the early part of that. You could think of this as five and a half G. This is an interim um, to 6G. And usually, this is, this is the usual thing. Uh, as a standard develops, they get more and more add-ons. Oftentimes, though, these add-on features, the half-G generations, um, they may not have fully thought it out. They have a good start at what it should look like. But much of what you see being developed under 5G advanced will form the basis for 6G. And we'll talk about what some of those um, study items are that are going into uh, 5G advanced in just a moment. But as you can see that um, the basic 6G will be here about 2028. That's actually not that long. This stuff is really complicated. Uh, I remember 1G standards, you could put in a book about this thick. 2G standard was like this thick. Uh, 3G standard, bookshelves. 4G, you wouldn't think about printing it out. <laughs> You'd put it on some server someplace. These things grow exponentially in complexity as they uh, progress in time. So it takes a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of planning. I'm always fascinated by how well they're able to, to pull together this vision of these uh, and specifications of these very complex systems. So we'll see that in 2028. But studies are already underway. Lots of talks are going on now about what that standard should be. This is the time in which people are, are developing the vision for it now. So let's look at release um, 18. This is the one that was frozen uh, last month, meaning that um, uh, they, they do not alter it. It's, it is definitely going to happen. So these are, many of them are study items. They're not official within the standard yet. Uh, these are things that, um, they have put working groups on to figure out how to do it. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. But it gives you um, an idea of what to expect in the future. One of the things that um, in my conversations with some of the uh, leaders in industry and academia have mentioned as a characteristic of 6G, the most common thing, is the incorporation of AI into the network. Um, AI, in order to be able to facilitate new applications, be able to optimize uh, the network better than a human, and more frequently uh, than a human. And eventually, lower cost as well. Um, for instance, one of the major cost factors in a service provider's budget, is, of course, is labor. But after that, second or third, is the cost of power. So one thing that you will see develop in 6G are metrics for power consumption. And it's not that they're trying to do good things. Well, they'll tell you they're trying to do good things for the planet. But it boils down to their bottom line. It's in their best interest to reduce power consumption. Uh, so that is going to be a, a, a very big driver for 6G. Um, it will help motivate the switch of it to, from 5G to 6G by showing that you can reduce cost. Reducing cost is the 
easiest product to sell. If you, if you can show a customer that you can reduce their cost, you've got to sell. Uh, there are other aspects of it uh, as well. They're going to continue to enhance what's called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, being able to use multiple antennas and take advantage of reflections in the environment. If I could send my signal this way, bounce off that wall to reach you, and then I could send a signal directly to you, and then I could send a, a signal that bounces off this wall and reaches you, well, I have three channels, and I could operate those channels on the same frequency by using different paths, and I can more or less triple my throughput to you. So that is something that became important for 5G, and it's going to continue uh, to evolve for 6G. Sidelink. Sidelink is a capability of peer-to-peer -peer communications. Think of it as a walkie-talkie that doesn't have to go through the base station. And this is particularly appealing to uh, firemen and policemen that building on that technology, they developed vehicular-to-vehicular -vehicular communications, the CV to X, cellular vehicle-to-anything kind of communications. Uh, another important aspect, and it's, it's been undergoing standardization now for the past couple of years, but probably won't be mature until 6G, and that is uh, a satellite communications mode, particularly for rural areas where base stations don't cover it, you'd be able to have a, a low-cost satellite link. And this also has all sorts of ramifications, as we're seeing in the Ukraine now with Starlink. If you've been reading the headlines about how Starlink has made a huge difference for the Ukrainians to provide a communications link that isn't hackable by the Russians and, and very difficult for them to jam. So it has far-reaching impact. And then finally, uh, there's something called NR, standing for New Radio, REDCAP, Reduced Capability. The idea here is that you're going to strip down a 5G system to its bare essentials with the goal of having a communications device that will uh, have a battery life of 10 years. So in 10 years, you're going to throw it away anyway. You don't even change the battery. And it's almost essential. If, if we're going to have a, a million devices per square kilometer, who wants to change all those batteries? <laughs> so in order to reach our massive machine-to-machine -machine communications, we've got to be thinking about this, about the power consumption. It's one of the reasons why we haven't seen massive machine-to-machine -machine communications so far on a large scale. Okay, so um, we are now at doing the uh, release 19. Um, freeze date expected in 2025 in terms of, of capabilities. Uh, but much of this in release 19 are studies that will lead to 6G innovations. Um, Energy efficiency as a service criteria is one of them. New metrics. There'll be new metrics in addition to throughput or jitter or latency. You know, how much energy did it take to transfer one bit? Uh, uncrewed aerial vehicles. Uh, UAVs that will fly around based on 6G or 5G advanced technology. Satellite access is, is being um, 
uh, refined. The current um, standardization activity in, in 5G on satellite access is something that we call the bent pipe. What it means is that you send your, your signal up to a satellite, it just gets amplified and redirected to the ground. There's not intelligent processing that is occurring on board of the, the satellite, nor routing between satellites. Uh, in some ways, Eli Musk is way ahead of 5G and, and his Starlink ne network because it is very much an active network. However, what will make this different, though, is this could end up in every single 5G handset, this capability. So you have the advantage of producing items on a mass scale, which will lower the cost of that item. So eventually, I expect that this will dominate, but it'll take a few years. So we can see 6G occurring around the 2028 20, for the basic configuration. Okay, so what, what's going to drive it? Uh, you know, we don't do technology for technology's sake. We do technology for an application. Here's some of the applications that I, I think are uh, important. Grid control, microgrids. We sort of dissect um, the grid. We have these small grids that can interconnect with each other on a dynamic basis using renewable um, energy resources. That requires uh, very low latency, requires robustness, uh, being able to service rural areas, and that points to a 6G solution for the grid control. Vehicular communications. Um, and I put a note on my slide there. Yes, 30 years late. <laughs> uh, vehicular communications. The first vehicular communication standard was uh, um, 802.11p, or otherwise known as DRS, Dedicated Short Range Communications. It was standardized in 1999. <laughs> we were expecting uh, commu uh, vehicular communications that was 20 years ago, or, um, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen because there wasn't a business model for it. Who's going to pay for all that infrastructure? For vehicle to roadside communications, for your vehicle to communicate with that stop sign. By the way, those stop signs are really expensive. You don't want to replace that. And we went through three, uh, two recession, three recessions now. <laughs> uh, and uh, nobody had the money to do that. So it never happened. What makes this different, though, is that there appears to be a, a business case for vehicular communications now. Instead of the, the government doing this, it could be service providers that are doing this. It's a natural extension of their business model. They can leverage the infrastructure that they already have. They're always looking for new things to sell the public. And by the way, you sell cars now not because they, the engine's worn out, but because you want the new electronics with your vehicle. So this is, this is what will drive it. There's a, a new term that has picked up in the, in the past couple of years, digital twin. Anybody know what a digital twin is? It's kind of a combination of, of simulation, emulation, but it runs so fast that, let's say you have a machine that is running in real time. If you take the, the state of that machine, you can send it to some software that you can explore how much or what you should change, what parameters you should change see what the result would be, and do it fast enough to send it back to the real-time system 
to implement those changes. So it's like running a simulation faster than reality. It allows you to explore and optimize the parameters of that system. It's a really very powerful engineering concept. Well, if you bring down the latency even more than 5G, you'll be able to do these digital tw twins. One of the applications we've been looking at is how you manage spectrum. Who should you let onto the airwaves? You want to do this really quick. Can you build a, a giant model of what the interference environment looks like and assess the impact of, of allowing a user to come in at a specific frequency and how it impacts the rest of the network? You can if you can do it fast enough. Sensing and communications. Um, a a um, combination of communications and, and sensing is something that is widely perceived as one of the benefits of 6G. An example could be car radar. Um, car radars, actually car radars are a disaster waiting to happen, by the way. I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, you have a, <coughs> a radar that picks up another car's radar, but your radar is unable to look around the corner to see if there's another car coming. You could leverage the car in front of you, its radar, to look out for you to see if there's a vehicle approaching. So you have this collaboration of, of uh, sensing and communications. Now the disaster comes from uh, so far, they haven't put it on ID signals on these radar signals. So there, we haven't hit a critical mass yet, but at some point, these radar systems are going to start interfering with each other. And when you have braking systems that depend upon these radar systems, you, know, you can imagine uh, what chaos could happen uh, on the freeway. So. One of the things that 5G will do, or 6G will do, is it's going to fix 5G. Uh, it'll fix it so that we do have the mass of machine to machine communications. Higher data rates, all we always have higher data rates. <laughs> um, lower latency, uh, better management of the spectrum. And it's also one of the drivers behind these generations. If you're going to sell a product, the more product that you, you can sell, usually the more profit you will make. Of course, you lower the cost a bit. But overall, if you have more product to sell, that puts you in a better competitive position. And over the years, capacity has improved immensely. Um, being able to handle more and more users in a given amount of spectrum. And that's going to continue with these uh, 6G systems. It will, it will be one of the applications, by the way, for AI, is what band do you choose? And how long should I stay at that frequency in order to have a, a robust connection with that base station? That's one of the key roles that AI will play in the future. Um, we'll see metrics that are human-specific uh, instead of app application-specific. Um, for instance, if you're doing email, you don't care if your email takes one millisecond more to download. But if you're uh, looking to communicate with another vehicle, you want to get off on the off the off-ramp, one millisecond might make a big difference. So these are, these are things in, in which uh, perception, uh, the speed depends upon human perception. You want to be able to operate at least as fast as a human in that similar situation. 
Of course, lower cost and more disaggregation. That is breaking apart the network. Uh, with the trend in wireless communications, we used to have a lot of dedicated hardware that did like the networking functionality. Now all of that is in the cloud. And a lot of those functions that operate in the cloud are separate functions. They're, they're specific, and those functions may reside at different places, but they all come together um, and act as a, as a unit. Uh, the infrastructure behind wireless now looks more like the infrastructure that Amazon uses to sell you a product. Things are located at different parts of the country. There's different functions. And if one function goes down, a function could be brought up at another part of the country to do that. That's the way wireless is headed. So what is 6G going to look like? Well, higher data rates, of course. Um, people are talking about uh, holographic transmission, three-dimensional transmission. That's going to use a lot of bandwidth, maybe up to 100 times as much bandwidth as having a plain video call with somebody. <laughs> There's these things called intelligent reflective surfaces. Intelligent reflective surface is a surface that when, a, when an electromagnetic wave hits it, you can control it. Will it go through that surface or will it reflect? And if it reflects, where do you want it to reflect to? So you can shape the propagation environment around you which will be great uh, in order to be able to, full, uh, to fill in coverage gaps that occur. You can create what we call your own multipath, echo, <coughs> to help reach that area, which may have been blocked before. That's actually going to require a lot of AI to do the optimization of that surface, uh, as well as other things for that surface. Um, you'll see a combining of network sharing and spectrum sharing, uh, particularly at higher frequencies. Uh, one of the things that 5G is touted for is millimeter wave communications, extremely high frequencies, 28 gigahertz and above. There's a problem at operating at those frequencies. As you go higher in frequency, the signals propagate more like light. That means they can be blocked easily. So, um, what that means for an operator is that you have to have a lot of base stations. And if you have a lot of base stations, you have a lot of cost. So why not share infrastructure? Why not share a millimeter base station between Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile? Why not share their spectrum as well? So everything becomes sharing. You know, it's one of the trends. We live in a sharing economy now. Airbnb is an example. Um, how you do that and still have a competitive environment is going to be some great business, economic, and social research, as, as well as engineering research ahead. <laughs> we also um, um, have um, terahertz systems. Terahertz systems are even wider bandwidth capable systems than millimeter wave systems. They look more and more like light. I'm somewhat skeptical, but these terahertz systems do have some really interesting sensing capabilities. Radar is just one of them. Gesture control, for instance, 
I've got a new car that has gesture control in it. Have you ever have gesture control? I want to turn off, I turn down the volume on my radio. I do this. Really, I do. And I love it. <laughs> I don't have to take my eyes off of the road to look for that knob. I just have these general motions that I can use. Um, terahertz is great for doing things such as that. There's also been some work in using terahertz to find pathogens. Imagine uh, if we had this technology during the pandemic. Uh, in, instead of testing people who resisted being tested, we could have tested rooms. You want to go in that room? It has a lot of COVID circulate in the air? No. It would have made all the difference in the world. So um, you can combine that, that sensing capability with wireless. You also see this in, in uh, government um, as well, and lots of government applications to, the, to um, uh, 5G advanced and, and 6G communications, particularly for DOD. Uh, one of the reasons why DOD is putting in so much money into 6G systems is the supply chain issue. Huawei is the uh, biggest owner of 5G patents, and they don't want to be buying their communication systems, their military communication systems from China. So it means a matter of developing that technology domestically. So a lot of these applications I've already uh, have gone over, but I'm gonna quickly go through, the, pass that by. Looking at, at how wireless becomes customized to individuals, this is another role for AI. Um, uh, this is a framework that we built at Virginia Tech that, that tries to predict your behavior and then adjust the radio network to suit your behavior, to customize it to your behavior. It learns patterns of life. Here's some of the examples of research that we're doing at Virginia Tech that supports uh, 6G systems. Um, lots, of, lots of research going on. I, I may not get into this because I want to make sure that we have time to um, have questions. So let me hit with a summary. One of the things that will be a major driver for 6G will be trying to fix 5G. Um, however, there will be new applications. As we improve the specifications for 6G over 5G, new, new applications will be possible. Um, 5G is, is very, very flexible. Um, uh, and it has a long ways to go to reach its full potential. So hence, I don't really expect a, a lot of differences in some ways in the overall architecture for 6G. Uh, the 5G architecture was plenty good right now. There's a lot of things that we can do uh, without major changes. Cost is gonna be a driver. Um, service providers are looking to lower their cost of operations, their cost of infrastructure. And DOD, DOD is going to develop 5G and 6G technology. They don't have as much money to put in on developing communication systems as Apple does. So they have to um, look to the commercial sector to help define their next generation military systems. Yes, they'll do some things special to it to make it more resilient, but basically it's going to be built on commercial uh, system architecture. All right. So, questions. <laughs>